My name is Glenda Pickerskill uh, and I'm a second generation farmer in the Mary Valley. I grew up in the Mary Valley. My parents had property at Imble and I went to the primary school at Imble and then we uh, sold up there and we moved into Gympie for a year. That was when I first went to high school. Uh, and then within a year, my, my parents had purchased another property out at uh, Kandanga, at Gumong, Gumong Road, Kandanga. And so I was fortunate to spend the teenage years there before I then went off to university. Uh, my, my father came and uh, the first, he, he was growing pineapples for the first crop uh, on the property at the end of Ballard's Road. And so uh, he did a number of years of pineapples and then and small crops. He had beans. I can remember he had beans, uh, pawpaws, um, that were the that were the main three. And we we actually had a, a draft horse called Dixie. And I just I, as a child I can remember Dixie was the one that used to pull the sled that had the pineals in, in it down these really, really steep hills. And so um, it progressed from him having the horse and horse-drawn implements to, for ploughing and for, for use to, we, we had a Ferguson tractor was the next thing. And uh, that was a little treasure. Um, so he, he went through, it, it was, surely wasn't that easy to um, not only grow the crops, but also to market the crops. I can remember we had people that used to come to the farm to help pick the beans. Uh, the pineapples was fairly, uh, he didn't have a lot of people involved with that, but bean picking. And um, yeah, it was a, a lovely area to grow up. I can remember spending lots of hours on the farm, just following around my parents when they were doing the the various work. And then he progressed into cattle. And so I remember we had, we started off with just some potty calves and hand feeding and raising them. But um, yeah, from small things grew to, you know, in the end of um, my, my parents' working lives, they had uh, a beautiful you know, property at, at Gumong and a, a lot of cattle. It's um, it was lovely to see the progression that he sort of bought property and then developed it and then sold um, and moved forward and supported the family. And we had uh, myself and three sisters. Uh, and uh, and you know we all grew up and had the a great were given the great opportunities uh, that um, perhaps my parents didn't see. And I think I'm very appreciative for that. Well, I guess. During my growing up, I, I learned a lot from my parents and what they were, the ways in which they tackled the challenges and the, and resolved the problems. And so that was wonderful grounding. I then went on to study agriculture at, at Gimby High School um, with Ro, uh, Mr. O'Rourke, their agricultural teacher. And and then I made the choice to go to university, and there I. I first of all thought I'd go and do science because there was such a broad, I loved mathematics, chemistry, physics, um, biology. And when it came to after the first year at university, I, I couldn't choose which one I wanted to major in and you really had to make the choice on the second year. And, and so I looked back to agriculture and thought, well, it encompasses all those different sciences and skills. And so I chose to, to go that direction and so I did a Bachelor of Agricultural Science, uh, which specialised in land use management. So that was the grounding that I achieved um, in Brisbane. My background is um, I went from the univer yes, university through to working, and my, uh, my role was with environment, so environmental management, uh, and I was able to get a job in Western Australia with Alcoa. Alcoa Australia, um, who were mining bauxite. And so I was able to, I stayed with them for 13 years. 
moving from a number of different roles within the company, uh, all in environmental management, um, but you know, being based up on the mine sites, to being in research, to to being with uh, the refineries. So a, a broad cross section of experiences. Uh, and then in '94, uh, well, uh, during that period of time, I I made this decision that I would love to come back to the to the land and to the valley. And so that was always my long term objective that I had. Um, well, probably be when I was 16, I, I uh, convinced my parents it would be good to, to have a property on the river, on the Mary River. Um, we were on Kandanga Creek at the time, and it wasn't as good as swimming in the, in the river. And I used to often go to the neighbours' properties and, and we would go down swimming. And, and I think that was where I first really fell in love with, with the Mary River. And so um, I had that vision of I would want to come back and to farm in the valley and my, it's certainly it's beautiful land to, to farm and it's uh, a privilege to be a land manager in, in our area. Um, it's just such a diversity of uh, experiences. You've got your droughts, you've got your floods um, and everything else that comes along with agriculture. I think one of the probably the most valuable story in my, in my memory is to do with the connection of understanding more about what was actually in the river and why it's so special. And I feel that I was unaware as, as a child growing up in the, in the valley and going regularly to swim in the river. I had no idea of the significance and the rarity of the species that are long lived um, you know, the Mary River turtle, the Mary River cod, uh, the Australian lungfish or the Queensland lungfish. They are just such amazing creatures that live to be, you know, close to 100 years old or more. And they were there. And just, we, we didn't have the, I, I didn't have, and I don't think many of um, my friends had the, at that time, had the knowledge of what was so special about those animals and how they'd survived for so long and their life cycles. And, and so to become involved with protecting Mary River turtle uh, nesting sites and actually um, be involved with Tyra Landcare and Marilyn Connell, who decided she was going to do a master's and study the, the age um, uh, and the population dynamics of the Mary River turtle and was out there uh, actively catching and, you know, holding and weighing and just that experience of um, being involved and learning of how much we don't know. So 85 was the year that I, I purchased the, my property that I'm on now for my parents. Um, so, and that's the, the river property that I convinced my parents to buy when I was 16. So it's kind of, yeah, that's a big, it was a big one. I continued to work for 13 years over in West Australia um, with our co-op, paying off the, for the property. And uh, in the 92 flood, we had a very big 92 and 94 floods. Um, we had a lot of bank erosion and it became quite obvious to me that we had to do something drastically to to save from losing a little land. And of course, where the soil was going was um, the banks, when they're unstable, the soil ends up down Harvey Bay and plumes of sediment and affects the sea grasses and the dugongs population. So lots of flow on effects. So it was at that time that I convinced our family to fence off the river from stock. And uh, it was 90, about 95 that we actually put in um, troughs and gravity fed, you know, pump water up to tanks and gravity fed it back through the property. So we had the cattle off the, the river. And that's particularly important because not only was 
allowing for natural regeneration to occur on the riverbanks. It was also improving the water quality. You know, the cattle are not down um, in the water, um, polluting the water. So, um, so, so that was a big, I think, from um, a, a looking, starting to look after the environment. Uh, it then, I then became very interested in growing my own trees and planting. So when I came back, um, 94, I permanently came back because my father said he'd like to go travelling and, and uh, so I, uh, uh, I decided I would come back and um, I grew a lot of my own trees and collected my own seed, the native seed from around the area. I began involved with World by Fund for Nature. I did part-time work with them for two years, three years. Uh, so I, I, I picked up on my knowledge of what plants were important, uh, the riparian rainforest and the importance of that, the shading component for controlling the temperatures, water temperatures and things. So, and, and the importance of wildlife corridors as well. So there was um, a big chunk of information that I was able to, to learn. But when I first came back for, in 94, I really didn't know too many, didn't feel like I knew too many people in the community, even though I'd grown up, I'd gone away and come back. And I think that happens with a lot of people, that they come back and you've got to reconnect with um, the community and, and become involved in activities. And so I, I think it's important to have that balance in life that you've got not only you know, the work part of it, but um, you have the opportunities to interact with the community and contribute to the community and improve things um, on that basis. So, um, so the yes, yeah, so the '92 and the '94 big floods were the pivoting point in the management of um, improving things for the for the environment and the river from uh, our farming perspective. One of the beautiful stories I've got to share is the Traveston Crossing. And the yeah, Traveston Crossing, um, I, as a child, we used to go down to the river there and it used to be sheer cliffs to jump off on that bend that's just upstream of the, of, um, of the Traveston Crossing Bridge. And so I'd seen that. That was the, that was a picture of, that I had as a child that they were the plant thing where you jumped off and it was steep and it was eroding. And... Uh, Gosh, what year did we do it? Um, it would have been have to be close to 2000. Uh, we did a tree planting, a community tree planter organised through World Wide Fund for Nature and Gibby Landcare. And we came in and we planted all the, I think all, all the trees where I'd grown um, in my little shade house on the farm. And so we planted that up and you look at it now and you just can't, it's just completely treed over and that whole change is joined up with another remnant further up of weeping lily pillies and bottle brushes and she oaks and just a multitude of different plants there. I can remember it very vividly. I walked into my uh, lounge room, the news was on, this was um, probably around six o'clock and here was a um, shot sh showing uh, Premier Beatty doing his helicopter fly over the valley saying, announcing a proposed dam and it was virtually over my, it was, over my property. And that was the first I'd heard about it. And a complete shock. I guess the ripples of um, uh, uncertainty went through the community pretty quick. I contacted my next door neighbours and uh, Rick and Carol Elliott and um, within a couple of days we had, well, within a day we had, we were trying to get more information, trying to understand what was going on because, you know, I had been involved in some of the, um, the water resource planning community consultation and at no point in that revision of the Mary Basin water resource plan was it ever mentioned that they were proposing to put a dam. There was a, a, 
strategic reserve was being mentioned, but nothing that indicated that that was to justify the dam. And that was the draft, um, between the draft and the final um, version was when they introduced the Traveston Crossing Dam. So it was a shock. It's not uncommon for um, dam builders all over the world to do a similar tactic of um, uh, shock the community and take on the attitude that it's a done deal. But it wasn't. I think they under underestimated the depth of knowledge and creativity and connections that, uh, in fact, that was uh, 2006. I had actually um, gone, a w I'd been working away from 2001 to 2006. I'd taken on some more um, work over in Western Australia because I'd purchased another small block of land next door to me and I needed to go back and work again. So I was um, doing fly in, fly out up into a, a Mount Keith, a nickel mine up, uh, above Kalgoorlie. And I was the environmental coordinator there in the end for a couple of years. So I had almost like three lives. I had to fly in, fly out from there to Perth. And then every six weeks I'd come home and do all my cattle work. My father stood in and caretaked for me, but I still had to come and run the business in some way. So it was, I only just um, finished there in 2006 and I arrived back and full time back on the on the farm and then this sort of hit me side <laughs> from the side um, so of course I, I felt pretty um, I'd say for a couple of weeks I just had knots in my stomach I just couldn't imagine that they could actually um, be planning to build a dam that would just completely annihilate everything that I had grown up with. I could not accept that that could ever be a possibility. And I guess that's the attitude that I then threw my energy into, um, finding out everything that I could, the facts and the data of what was behind the proposal and where the flaws were. And when you started to talk with, um, we had a depth of um, uh, knowledge in our community of you know, engineers, scientists, and we started to pull apart various um, assumptions in the, in the uh, proposal, there were a lot of flaws. But it wasn't until we formed a, we had a committee going within a month, um, you know, people like Steve Burgess, Kevin Ingersoll, Oh, there's just a, a wide number of people that um, were able to show quite uh, quite clearly that this was very, very wrong, and it was. Um, it seemed that it was motivated to capture votes for for Brisbane or um, in providing in creating. Um, a water shortage problem, which, when you looked at the amount of you know all the assumptions of it, it comes back to how much people use per day in their households, and um, where can they be more efficient? Um, the solution of building a dam would not have solved the problem that they looked like they were facing. They were going to run out of water, and um, I think it's got to be. Um, the solutions like catching water where it falls, you know, in tanks, in stormwater basins, recycling water, you know, even desalination if it needs to, have far, far less environmental and social consequences than building more dams. Well, very much so. And yet in the environmental impact statement, they were claiming that there wouldn't be any impacts downstream even though they were proposing to not only take the surface water, but to build a wall that would in intercept the groundwater as well. And that was clearly shown in some of the diagrams that they were, but they were still trying to say, no, won't, won't affect the, uh, the downstream river, the flooding, the 
um, you know, fisheries down in Harvey Bay. Uh, and that was why there was a very strong group of people um, downstream that were came in and formed their own group and came in to combine in the campaign was that um, they were their voices weren't being heard. When we first got the committee going, I was involved in particularly coordinating the research side of it, so collecting the facts and the data. Because um, one of our, we only had a couple of opportunities in which we could have a say back on the proposal. So one of the key ones was when the government put out an environmental impact statement um, or study, which was, it stood up this high in, in volumes of um, paperwork, weighed 15 kilos, it was pretty impressive. And when we went through that, we were able to pick just loads and loads of um, inaccuracies, I guess you could put it, yeah. And, and then, so the process is that they issue that out. Um, you then have an opportunity to put submissions into um, to that, so that's public submissions. So I coordinated our submission from the group. But of course, we also provided uh, and helped people to look at w in their particular situation or um, how it was going to impact them and, and so be able to give them some, um, uh, some support in, in understanding, first of all, the process. So they had to have um, a public uh, submission period and then the government had to um, go through all those submissions. And from that, the coordinated, uh, coordinated general would have to make um, a supplementary environmental impact statement. Uh, and then eventually he would he would either say yes it could go ahead now this is the state uh, could go ahead or it, or it couldn't in the end uh, okay so that was that's one part of the assessment process the second part because it was going it was uh, a project that could affect matters of environment national environmental significance it brought into play uh, the federal law the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Law, the EPBC law. So the federal government had an opportunity to say whether it would go ahead or not. So it needed two levels of government approvals to be able to go ahead. And they, at the start, they had none. They had no approvals. So they announced the dam, but there was no approvals. And, and so that was one of the key things for people to understand that there, there, there was opportunity that it could be stopped. It could be stopped by the state government or it could be stopped by the federal government. And in fact, really, it was the state government who were wanting to propose the, it was a um, uh, Queensland Water Infrastructure, which was the company that was formed, it was a government company so it was really the government looking after its um, government's project. So it had to be the state government, so it had to be the federal government to stop it. So that was the only stop that we could do it unless for some reason um, there was a change in the state government that perhaps if it was a different government they would have not gone ahead, but maybe they would have done, we don't know. We never could know. But so, um, so that assessment process uh, was the only thing that we could work to and the time frames were very, very important. There's lots of things that happened. In fact, it was a very exciting um, campaign because there were just new things happening all the time. There's opportunities to uh, raise awareness at different points. There was, you know, there were state elections, so we could be able to bring it in as, a, as an issue for a, um, for a state election and, and, you know, sort of lobby um, you know, going into marginal seats and, and finding, uh, um, influencing and making sure people were aware that these were issues that this state government was um, um, making decisions about. Uh, 
there were opportunities to get more support from within our community, our own community, communities linked up and down the river. And, and we had this lovely um, supportive man of, of, of Steve Possett, who was a kayaker, who ki- he just did so much kayaking. You know, he kayaked right down the, from Brisbane, up the Stanley River, up the Brisbane River, up through um, Wyvernhoe Dam, across Toadie's, um, pulled his kayak on wheels, up over the, the range and, and then down into the Mary and then paddled the Mary and was able to galvanise and, and, and raise that awareness um, right through the whole river system. Um, and then he paddled back to Brisbane. And, you know, that sort of story. And he was uh, instrumental in paddling then from Brisbane to Sydney to raise awareness um, on the federal level. He met with, you know, he took support letters and was able to, all these different, I guess, events, you might say. We got involved with the Get Up and um, got support from them. We had a Get Up torch that we did events. And it was an opportunity to share knowledge, build community spirit and um, connect with not our own, just our own community, but, you know, Brisbane community, Harvey Bay, Mirabara, it, and, and it was fun. It was a fun way to get that message out. Yeah. That's why it was so important to have those rallies mm. emotionally for people, mm. is to be able to connect and get support. You know, the, the canoeing line, when, uh, within a month, that was the end of May, uh, it's actually what my dad suggested. He said he had a, a, a friend from Tasmania and she, my dad said, well, why don't you contact Bob Brown? I said, well, I could try. <laughs> and yeah, he came up and that was one of the f- first flotillas that we did. And it brought lots of people out. We had helicopters flying around. We had more support from social um, media side of things um, to raise that awareness. And, uh, and yeah, he's, he did, a, uh, you know, help, help with that. But we, we approached um, all, all the different um, parties, government parties. Uh, we had a lot of support from all of them to, to open doors to share the facts and the data that we had, we had found out so that everybody um, on, on, you know, state and federal levels, um, we tried to um, provide that information to say this is wrong, this is, this is flawed. There are a lot more cost-effective, social, less socially damaging, less environmentally da- damaging solutions to this problem. Can we, can we talk about it? Can we get the support for that? Um, I'd never been to Canberra before that time, no. so... I ended up going three times to Canberra with with our group. Um, uh, we we walked the the halls of Canberra and um, and we shared a lot of information. So the state government had had assessed. So the coordinator general had assessed the project, and he he'd announced that he would approve it uh, with twelve hundred conditions. So that's where the state government stood. Uh, and then it was, it was up to the federal government to um, make a call on whether they supported it or not. Um, the, uh, the then Minister for Environment uh, was Peter Garrett. And he looked at, he called in independent experts to help in the assessment of it. Um, At the same time as that was happening, we had also, there was um, a a legal court challenge to the operation of the last dam that had been built by the state government in Queensland, and that was Paradise Dam. Now, Paradise Dam uh, had been built with a million dollar um, fish lift 
and Fishway and the challenge, legal challenge to that, and it wasn't our group that did that. So it was the conservation group up, up on the Burnett River that were had the legal challenge um, at the federal courts in Brisbane of the operation of the fish lift and that it wasn't uh, operating and it wasn't providing pas fish passage for the Queensland lungfish. So that was the fundamentals of that. So that, that was built in 2006, opened in 2006, and it hadn't, um, it wasn't doing what it, the mitigation measures that were being proposed for Traveston Crossing Dam were the same. And so that's why it was, that was quite an important court case um, to, to bring to bear because it was the same, um, it was the same method that was being proposed. So, so that was hap that was sort of happening. In fact, a group of us from the committee were down in the federal courts at the time when that when this announcement came out, and we just had this little message on the phone saying no. <laughs> we sort of said, "Well, what does that mean?" <laughs> and then, of course, we found out that it was Minister Garrett had announced that he would say no to the decision to um, to dam. The Mary River at Traveston Crossing, and of course the party started. And, and to see, for me to see um, and experience the relief of finally having the uncertainty closed about um, the proposal. See, I my property was in stage one um, of the proposal, and the roof of my house would have been the top of stage one. So. And I was only a couple of kilometres away from the where the wall was proposed, so I was pretty well in the front line. And there was um, 85 in the end, 85% of the properties had been voluntarily acquired, not compulsory, voluntary. They, the government stood in the marketplace, and uh, they were the only ones who wanted to buy buy land, of course. No one's going to buy a property that you're not sure if it's going to be there or not. So, um, so there was fifteen percent of us that uh, that didn't. But irrespective of that, and everyone had their own reasons for staying or selling or selling and leasing back. Uh, everybody's in their own place, and there's no. Um, uh, you know, that's, we're, we're very understanding of that, always. In, in my own personal situation, um, my father had been, this was not the first time that a dam had been proposed in that area. For him, it was the third time. Back in 74, it was announced. Uh, 92, it was announced. In both those situations, um, it was discarded because of agricultural, for social, economic reasons it was um, it was dismissed but he thought the third time was going to be the one and so it created for our family uh, yeah it, it was not easy because he had the mentality well it was he was at an accepting point um, whereas I was completely the opposite I had not been through those other two experiences you now my parents were they got divorced in 92, so who knows how much of that uncertainty could have been impacting on my family back then. Mm. Uh, it does, it, it, it impacts on families and when you lose long-term um, neighbours, mm. I would have had some neighbours that would be my neighbours for 20, 30 years at least. Uh, but from all that, there's some really good, you know, my new neighbours are great. I think it's brought a lot of um, new ideas and creativity uh, to the valley. So, you know, there's always good that comes out of challenges. And I think it, sometimes it's, it's adversity that brings and um, directs people's energies in certain directions to really show what's important to people, their values. And, and you know, that's one of the key things I, I love to be in the valley is because I share with many others similar values for not only um, 
you know, for agriculture, for looking after our soils, for looking after our, our wildlife. Um, but the, yeah, the fun and the creativity that we have. And I think one of the, the lovely things we, we had after the announcement, we made the decision that we'd like to have a celebration um, once a year, and that's the Mary River Festival. And that's an opportunity for us to come back together and to share and to, to do some fun things together and reconnect um, with people maybe you haven't seen all year. And so I think, uh, I think that's a lovely uh, way to continue that education and um, an appreciation and celebration of the river. Well, it's, uh, in, in the, during the campaign, I went overseas as well to give them more international support. Um, I got the opportunity to go to the uh, uh, Water Expo in Spain and to take to that expo, uh, they had a pavilion dedicated to pe peoples that were affected by water policy and we were able to take the Mary River story to there and to share and learn what was happening all around the world. And there were, there were some really common threads about how dams were being announced um, how they're being built and how they were affecting lots and lots and lots of communities downstream, upstream, and um, not only uh, that personal loss of, uh, of place, I guess you'd call it, loss of place, um, but people who had, you know, where dams had collapsed and they were downstream and communities completely wiped out because of that. See, a dam is not built forever. It's, it's life, it's built for a lifespan and it's usually 70 to 100 years. And so in America and overseas, uh, in, in Europe, there's a number of places where they're actually pulling down dams because they are not, um, they've affected the rivers ecologically too much. They've, um, They've changed the uh, it's um, the economic reason why they are put in place has changed and it's not needed anymore. For example, um, but there are a number of I was able to meet with groups who had actually you know not only stopped dams being built but actually pulling down dams. And, and then what are the ecological effects where you've got these sediments and they might be contaminated and it, it, it just goes on. It, you change that flow, flow of that river system um, and, and there are other solutions out there and that's what we were able to share. So I, I got to go to Mexico as well after the decision. We, we were invited back by the International Rivers Network to, to share what our learnings were and uh, we, um, Steve Burgess and I went to, to visit on that. Um, so there's that international level that we were able to support and, um, and to share that knowledge of long-term impacts that I don't believe we had that good understanding here in Australia. The, the first one is to do with, you say, okay, we've stopped the dam, that, that dam proposal. But there's a process here that people need to be aware of is that uh, the water, the Mary Basin Water Resource Plan that justified the Travis and Dam proposal uh, in 2006, it under state legislation has to be reviewed every 10 years. So in 2016, the 10 year decade, um, when it should have been review reviewed, um, it was postponed by the Minister for another five years to 2021 to gather more research on how um, the water flows uh, were understanding more about the water flows basically and how it affects um, different species in the river and, and so forth. And I guess to look at um, long-term water use trends and so forth. So, uh, so that was due out in 2021, which that's this year. <laughs> and at the moment, there's been no community consultation 
involved with that. However, we know uh, there's just recently been some discussions with the department. And we understand there is now, they're, they're certainly working on it and there will be um, a process to involve people and, and I'd urge that uh, that that is uh, a very, very important consideration. We really don't want something like what happened back in 2006. Um, it's important that the whole, you know, people, the community have not any consultation, but a proper input on, okay, if there's some problems there, of water shortage, you know, what are the best solutions? Now, there's um, Water for Life, is a state document um, that um, SEQ Water have put out, and they're looking at long-term, um, long-term water planning. Uh, in that last version of that document, it said that one of the considerations were they identified there was going to be, could be some shortages up in the northern section of SE, southeast Queensland, uh, and that there are some options out there to consider. One of them is to take more water from the Mary. Uh, we are hopeful that the full consideration of the water resource plan, the revision, will look at that and we could clearly see from the data uh, of the last water resource plan that the water in the Mary River is over allocated already and particularly during the dry months of the year it doesn't meet the environmental flows required for the health of the river. So, see, a lot of water is being siphoned off the Mary River already through uh, Broome Pocket Dam. It, it's up near Mullaney. And so, um, you know, that water's already been taken out of the catchment and it means that it doesn't flow down the river. Okay, so it's already having a, a, a big impact on that. And I, I know from a landholder, the the number of um, small floods that we have has been reduced a lot because most of the water does fall up. I mean, most of the rain does fall up in the wetter catch part of the catchment, up in the uh, you know, the south part of the catchment, up near Mullaney and Barumba Dam and so forth. So it influences the freshers that you have in the river, and you know when the finely filled up Broome Pocket Dam it starts to overflow because the river responses are much, much quicker. Um, so that's just, a, you know, so um, it's important that the water, before even taking more water out of the Mary, all the other things need to be considered. And there's lots of other alternatives that are cheaper. Um, you know, the water efficiency, everyone should have a tank on their house. Everybody. Um, it's, you know, Recycling water is, you always have water from wastewater and it's a technical technology we have already in place. It's used a fraction of the opportunity that it could. Uh, so catching water where it falls is the cheapest, most efficient. Everybody knows how much water you've got in your tank. <laughs> That's just, uh, yeah. And you know, if, if the worst comes to worst and you do need more water, the most, um, non-climate dependent solution is desalination but using renewable energy not more coal-fired um, powerhouses so so that's yeah that's the and and they've identified that those are options but we need to be encouraging stronger consideration of water recycling of water efficiencies um, before they ever look to take more water from the Mary got a lot of farm surfaces that if you can catch the water off them if you're it's far better than sitting it into a, a dam that's going to evaporate over the coming months or seep into the ground or so forth yeah, the losses are huge compared to if you've got it contained within a tank you know it's there you know how much you got yeah so that's my first point my second point is um is about what do i miss what am i missing now um from when I grew up, perhaps, or even the, over the last maybe 20, 20 year time frame, I feel that um, we are losing uh, a lot of 
um, environmental values that are really, really important to uh, to us as a, as as human beings. Um, one is the amount of increasing in no noise. I live close to a road and the amount of increase in traffic noise that I hear not only from my local roads but from bigger arterial roads. You know, we need to have more consideration for how that happens and I'm, I'm, I am hopeful that we'll go to electric cars soon which will be quieter and, and so forth but I think um, I think noise, because when you have that, that noise impacts on your daily life, you, know, you lose the, some of the things that I, I really value is the, the sounds of the birds. You can't hear the sounds of the birds like you used to be able to hear. Um, so that brings me to the, um, you know, the clearing. We've mentioned tree clearing. I, I see properties that completely clear every tree off the, off the land. And don't they understand that trees play such an important role in, in you know, our, our environment? Um, it's, it's for our wildlife, it's for, for us. Um, it's for protecting water quality, it's, it's for <laughs> so much. So yeah, I, I think that there's, there's, there's the, um, the noise aspect and a light pollution as well. I, I can see from my back veranda, 35 lights that are associated with a service station, and um, an off ramp. And um, you've lost all the starlight from that whole area. And I think that's another thing that's very wrong. I travelled overseas when back in '85, '86, and I went to a lot of different countries. I went to South America and. North America and Europe and, and in that year that I travelled just with my backpack I really did feel, feel that the valley was the place I wanted to be long term. You really come back and really appreciate what's, what's around you.